So let's talk about the student enrollment. Where you stand this year, what this year's kind of been like. You're a state school in Illinois and it's, you've been struggling. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we tend to think that it's SIU that's been struggling. In fact, this is a bigger problem than that. Uh, not only is the, the birth rate and number of high school graduates down across the country, but if you look at the, there was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, I think the, the 20 schools with the biggest drop in enrollment over the last, whatever it was, five, 10 years, something like that. There were five schools from, five universities from Illinois in the top 20. So I tend to think of it not as an SIU problem, but an Illinois problem. And I think the state legislators are recognizing the impact that underfunding the state universities has had over the last several years, and the budget impasse really was devastating and pushed everybody over the edge. And they, they recognized that. I was at Western during it, Western Illinois University, so I'm one of those state schools that remember what it was like. And right. It was very, I was scared for faculty and staff. Yeah. And you've been with the university multiple years. What have you seen over those years with enrollment? And we said it was decreasing, but have you seen anything different other than enrollment numbers? You know, it, it's hard for, as the, my association since 1973 really has been largely with the School of Medicine. And enrollment is not a medical school problem. I remember when I was an associate dean on campus here or early in my tenure as dean, uh, other deans would come up to me with a furrowed brow and say, how is your enrollment? And all I could think of was, you clearly don't get it, do you? Because we have no trouble filling a class of 72 medical students every year. I mean, we would get 1,400 applications for 72 spots. So uh, I was obviously pretty insulated and isolated from that. But it's obvious that enrollment is, is down. I mean, you can see that as you walk around the campus. You used to see herds of, of students, and, and it's not that way anymore. But again, this is not unique to SIU. And with next year, you're hoping to bring enrollment up for freshmen, but it probably isn't going to match the senior class that's leaving. Right, and that's a message that, that I've tried to confer. And uh, we have 4,200 seniors. So if they all graduate, walk across the stage and out to get a job, um, it's unlikely that they're gonna be replaced by 4,200 freshmen highly unlikely. So rather than fixate on what the, the total enrollment decline has been, let's focus on what we're building and what we're growing. So how big is the incoming freshman class? And, and I'm trying to repeatedly, and I don't know if I do it often enough, but repeatedly make the point to literally everybody on this campus that enrollment is everybody's business. How we how we treat students, AKA customers. So our customer relation work has to be first rate. And uh, the courses we teach have to be high quality. The research opportunities and employment opportunities that we have, it's the whole package, I think. And you took over after Montemagno passed and he said before, at the beginning of the school year, his goal was to have so many students by 2025. Even though he's not here anymore, did you continue? Do you, is your goal to continue increasing that enrollment? Clearly the goal is to continue increasing enrollment, but I can't produce students out of thin air. Uh, I don't know where he got his projection, and obviously he's not here to, to explain it. Um, but I think we want to grow the size of the place, but we want to grow quality as well. So 
I'm very reluctant to take students who are underprepared and we have a big freshman class and everybody's very happy and then they don't, they underperform and drop out, flunk out. So what did they get for their effort? You know, they got a trip to Carbondale and some pretty significant debt that they're not in a good position to repay now. So, I mean, let, let's focus on admitting people who can succeed. Let's give them a good education and opportunity and, and go from there. And besides his enrollment numbers he wanted to increase, he also talked about reorganization here at the university. Where does that stand now that his, he's not here? Right. Uh, again, reorganization is something that I, and I'm pretty new to the, the undergraduate game, if you will. My, I played in the medical school realm. Um, but as I got on campus and started reading about undergraduate things, if you will. You know, SIU is not leading the pack at reorganization. This is going on all over the place. Everybody's trying to figure out what we can do to have our organization make sense. Uh, if nobody majors in history anymore, what do you do? I don't and it's difficult for universities because we don't pivot and move on a dime. Uh, you've got a history faculty and we don't just say, well, see ya, you know, thanks for your service. Um, but I think we have to be able to adapt. And, and I think his schools make sense. And, you know, we've got majors that didn't used to exist when I went to college. And so how can we link them, and they, some of these majors wound up being in colleges where you go, how did they get there? It made sense at the time, 25, 15, five years ago, but now you look at it and go, that doesn't make any sense at all. Well, okay, let's call a timeout and try to restructure things. Now, challenging it is, because it's sort of like changing a tire on a moving car, isn't it? I mean, we don't just say, all right, we're going to just take a big time out here. Everybody hold their breath. We're going to reorganize, and it'll be a couple months or a year, and we'll get back to you. I mean, we can't do that. So we have to do it with, while things are in motion. But students aren't going to notice a change. I think it's, but if you've got small departments, in separate colleges where they don't fit, but they make sense with each other. And now we coalesce and we've got a bigger department with a critical mass. I think that makes more sense. Is it going to save some money? Yes, but it's not going to be the economic windfall that will save the day. But it just needs to make sense. And speaking of money, you heard at least what I've read, that there could be more money coming to higher education in the next fiscal year budget. And with that money, have you heard a number? Are they increasing it? And if so, what are they going to do different here? What is SIU looking to get from the state budget? Well, I think, if I remember correctly, we've asked for a 7% general revenue fund increase. Uh, the Illinois Bar Board of Higher Education is going to recommend a 10% increase. It, it's varied. Some schools have asked for a lot of money. I mean, upwards of in excess of 30%. I mean, uh, and part of it is trying to catch up, frankly, because uh, we took a, a beating in the budget impasse. I think it was we got 21% of, of what we had budgeted for that year. So what is that? We still paid our bills, but that meant we had to sweep all these other unrestricted cash accounts. And so what do you do now if, if the roof leaks? I mean, it becomes duct tape, you know, and hold your breath until we can get it fixed. Now, again, 
The legislature, I believe, recognizes the problem. They also want to do a capital bill to do some building, construction, get people working. Um, but the reality is that the state has seven or eight billion, with a B, dollars of unpaid bills. So, you know, it's, a, it's tricky. So even if SIU does get seven or even 10%, does that mean that you guys can kind of breathe a little bit better or you still have to worry about those loans? Well, th there are no loans per se, you know, and I, I misspoke uh, after a, a recent board meeting. SIU, the system, has its accounts and they can move money back and forth. And the unrestricted dollars, so the School of Medicine, for example, if they have unrestricted dollars in their sub-account, then SIU Carbondale could use that and whatnot. But the, I, I think there was some money transferred from Edwardsville to Carbondale, but that was for a period of a couple of weeks, I think. It was not anything significant. So it's, it's the cash flow issue that we have to be careful of. And with the budget, does that mean, and pardon me for asking this question, if SIU gets 7% more, is that 7% more for all SIU's campuses or is it just Carbondale's budget? No, that would be for the system, the entire okay. system. Okay, so the School of Medicine and also Edwardsville right. would see that as well. Right. Okay. Do you, and I'm only asking this because I saw the numbers, do you remember the numbers? Is it like 87 million? So I thought it was going to be 100 and, at 7%, at I think it winds up being like 184 million, okay. something like that. 195. That would be 195 with... would be 7% 7 7 increase. So 195 million you guys would receive if you got that 7% increase. Right, right. So these legislatures that, that are working to give that increase, have they specifically asked SIU in general what you guys are looking for? No. Uh, uh, you know, we have to submit needs, wants, et cetera. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of deferred maintenance, you know. Here we are, we're sitting on a 150-year-old campus. And that doesn't mean that all the buildings are 150 years old, but um, you know, there are things that you need to do on a continuous basis uh, to make sure that roofs don't leak and you know, computers are not outdated and things of that nature. Um, sorry, I wanted to make sure I hit all my questions. Um, Let's move to what you are looking for in the next two days from all the trustees coming together. What do you think, is there anything unusual that you are worried about or anything that's a big topic in these next two days? No, I mean, an obvious one is the appointment of the, the interim chancellor. Uh, a person who is well known to this campus, John Dunn, has served here over the years and is a native of Pinckneyville. So, I mean, he he knows the landscape, and and that's a real plus. Um, I, you know, this will probably this may be the last uh, regularly scheduled meeting of this board of trustees. Several members of the board are likely not to be, uh, they either their term is up or they may not be reappointed or whatever the case may be. So um, we're in 2019, we're looking at a new board. So what I'd like is uh, the outgoing board to finish off the year with uh, a, a tone of, of stability and optimism looking forward. I mean, yes, we know what the problems are, but let's start 
tackling the solutions. That's what I'm looking at. And in the past, there's been some issues between SIU and SIUE. Do you feel like those are almost put in the past and you're all moving forward as a team? I, I certainly would like to think so. Uh, I think these issues, it's easy for us to think that they arose in the last 12 months. Uh, I, as you might imagine, I know people who have been in this community for a long time. Uh, my 97-year-old father-in-law, for one, uh, who remembers when Carbondale faculty and staff would drive to Edwardsville to teach courses and help them get started. Uh, my father-in-law is a dentist, and he, every Monday, he would go to Edwardsville to work chairside with the dental students. Um, so, and it was a far-sighted thing, I think, by Delight Morris to start a school in a growing suburban area. And I think there's, is there jealousy, envy, whatever. Um, but it's my view, and I think I know that a large contingent of people on both campuses, Edwardsville and Carbondale, see us as having a politically stronger position working together where we can improve the lives of the people of this region in Southern Illinois by the programs that we have. So the university in Carbondale is an economic driver. We're a big employer. We cause people to come to this region and spend their money and live and work, so. The only other thing thing that I have on here is, and you've kind of answered this, but I'll still ask it in case you have anything else you want to say about it. Is the university, do you believe the university is healthy? Do you believe the university is in good health? So you're asking a, a health question of a physician. <laughs> so, I am. Yeah, right. Is the heartbeat regular? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we've seen the worst of it and we're on the road to recovery. This doesn't mean that, I had, I, that I've given the university some magic pill and now it's all better. Uh, this is, it's going to take a while. There's, you know, we're not going to see a spike in the high school graduation rate where students are appearing out of nowhere all of a sudden. Uh, this is, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with this for many years into the future. We can do it. The, the folks here are smart. They want this to, to succeed. They care. Uh, we'll be okay. Um, and I don't know, you mentioned a little bit about Dr. Dunn. Can you say anything else about him? Um, he accepted your offer or the position? Right now, it's not a Dunn done deal you. to raise a pun, but uh, uh, it won't be con until he's confirmed by the Board of Trustees. It's not official. But uh, I think he and I are in agreement. Uh, he's been doing some consulting work since he stepped down as the, the president of uh, Western Michigan. He had a very successful tenure there and I think was very loved by the, the folks there. Started a medical school there, which is no small accomplishment. So, and again, he cares. He could just, you know, stay home and, you know, go fly fishing or whatever it is that he, that he wants to do. Uh, but I think he cares and he has the knowledge and skill to help his home region. For you and for him, what, how long is the length normally of an interim position, especially the positions you two are in? Yeah, I would say interim positions vary, and they could be literally weeks or months to a year plus. Now, because we're in this fairly unusual situation where I'm the interim president 
and he's an interim chancellor. So what's the, the sequence of events here? If we went out and searched for a permanent chancellor and we said, don't worry, we'll find you a good president and I'm sure you'll get along with them. You might be tempted to say, well, thanks, but when you get a permanent one, let me know and I'll see how well I get along with them. So we've got to get a permanent president first. That search has started. Um, once the, the permanent president is seated, then I think we can start a search for a chancellor. And that president will make his or her presence an ideology felt and people will develop feelings about them and a relationship towards them that will pave the way, I think, for the hiring of a, a, a chancellor. So uh, it's going to be a while before we get a, a permanent chancellor, I think. I mean, I think I'm optimistic and hoping that we can get a president seated by next summer. And then that person would come in. I would hope that by Christmas or thereabouts of next year, we could start a search for a chancellor, looking to have one by the following summer. So when you asked Dr. Dunn, did you kind of say, are you in this for the long haul of three uh, years? He, he's, he's aware. Okay. Yeah, he's aware. 